All right, guys, let's get started. Um, so contrary to what uh, the PowerPoint actually says, my name is Meredith, not Tim, and I'll be talking to you guys through case construction and tactics today. Sounds kind of, kind of dry, and it actually is a little bit dry, but this stuff is really, really important because it's not enough just to be somebody who can speak beautifully and knows a lot of theoretical knowledge about the way that the world works or, you know, has read all the articles on, you know, CNN.com and therefore has the ability to construct a solid case simply on site by virtue of having lots of facts. One thing that's incredibly important, it's often really underrated within a team or within your own speech, is that the way that your case is constructed and the way that you assemble your ideas is just as important about what you actually say, so that other content and the way you actually present it. So the way that you make the decision about having a model and the way that you approach a case or the way that you actually prioritise arguments. So if you put your harms before your theory, your case is going to fall down. It would be far less effective than if you had thought as a team about how to actually construct that case. The other reason why this is really useful, and this is um, something you can all take away, is it actually makes you firstly a better debater to be able to understand case construction. But the second thing is it actually makes you a vital asset to a team because not everyone really takes the time to learn and understand this. So if you're somebody who has a really good understanding of how to write a case and how to write it well, you're somebody when it comes to making Austral's teams and making World's teams that people are actually going to want to seek out and say, hang on a second, you know, I know Claire really well, she's a great debater, but also she's great at writing cases and she'll make a great Easter's team leader and that kind of thing. So it's really worth investing the time to get this kind of theoretical knowledge. So. What we're going to talk about today are a couple of different things. The first thing we're going to start with is just the basic things you need to do with someone who constructs a case, and they go through a range of different things. So basic stuff like defining a topic, creating a model, and so on and so forth. The case construction is also about tactics. It's about whether or not you run a hard or a soft line, or about how you actually learn how to respond to those kinds of things when you're in opposition. So let's start at the very beginning. The basic kind of shit you have to do when you get a topic, you're in a team, and you're trying to write a case. The first thing you need to do, pretty straightforward, is be able to define the motion, figure out the keywords. So anyone who's ever done any kind of debating before or has ever written an essay and had to work out the keywords that exist there will know that what you need to go through in like go through it and understand what's in there. So if it's a topic about banning something, you're probably gonna to want to make sure you actually fulfill the topic and ban it, not just, you know, maybe find people who do it or anything like that, like actually ban it, remove it from sale, and then go through and work out who those stakeholders are who might be involved. The second thing you need to do is to make sure that you have a strong model. So what a debating topic normally asks you to do is solve a problem, and you need to be able to have that model, which is essentially a glorified solution to that problem. The next thing you need to be able to think about, we'll go through each of these in turn, don't worry, is have an understanding of what your worldview is. So understanding who you are in a debate. And that doesn't mean, you know, hey, I'm Meredith, I'm the first speaker of the affirmative team. What that means is that you understand the theoretical grounding your case is emerging from. So let's say you're doing a topic about uh, banning euthanasia. So what you're um, you know, assuming, the kind of worldview you're um, putting yourself into, the shoes that you're filling, is somebody that isn't necessarily a libertarian, somebody, somebody who probably sits to the right of the political spectrum. And what you've done by thinking about those issues and thinking about your worldview is that, let's say, it's a British parliamentary style, or even if you're just doing three on three, you get an attack from your opposition that maybe you didn't think about. An attack that kind of puts you, you know, like, take, um, what's the word? It kind of puts you in the back foot and you're not really sure how to respond to. If you understand your worldview and you know exactly what your team stands for and the theoretical basis, there's a grounding of all your argumentation, you can respond to that. If they say, would you also ban the right of people to, oh, I don't know what a good analogy would be, would you also ban X? If you haven't thought about it, you probably sit there for a second and go, well, you know, I, I just don't know. I haven't really thought about it. Are they the same? Are they different? But if you know your worldview, it gives you a really strong basis for comparison. So that kind of theoretical underpinning and that knowledge of the, um, the theory of your case is absolutely vital. Uh, the next thing you need to look at is what's the problem? Are you solving it? We'll come to that. Stakeholders um, are, is a really useful way of going through and actually creating the arguments that will form the bulk of your case. So um, a good example would be is if you were let's say, banning trade unions. So that's a, we'll use that example quite a bit, but it's a really good example of a topic where there are multiple stakeholders that you need to take care of or need to um, think about. 
So let's talk about industry's response. Let's talk about business's response. Let's talk about government. And you need to deal with each of those single people and each of those groups that have a vested interest in a change in the status quo. And the last thing we're going to go through and we're going to talk about are what are possible responses to your case and how you can deal with those. Because it's not enough just to write what you think is a strong case. You need to be realistic and acknowledge that sometimes you're going to have to argue for some stuff that's actually pretty crappy and it could actually be incredibly difficult. You need to acknowledge that from the get-go at the very beginning of your case construction and build in responses. So I saw a debate on the weekend between actually some school children and it was about, what was it about? It was about um, stopping the sale of uranium. And what these kids were saying on the affirmative team, they're like, no, 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 uranium, it's just not a big deal for Australia, only makes up 0.5% of our GDP, we'll stop shipping it, it'll totally be fine, there won't be an economic impact. And anyone who knows anything about economics is you know, going to be reasonably um, able to understand that firstly, losing such a significant part, even if it is small, of your GDP will have an impact, but also that you lose any possibility for future growth. And so what that team did there was by trying to minimise the harm, by saying, no, no, there won't be an impact, they actually totally shot themselves in the foot. What they needed to have said was, yeah, it's going to be difficult. We're going to lose a lot of revenue, but here are the reasons why it's worth it. So if you can do that, you can realise that you may have to argue for things that are difficult, you're going to get attacked on them, and building the res responses to your case, you'll do heaps, heaps better. Cool. So the basic things when it comes to case instruction, and we'll go through all those now. So let's talk about models. Can anyone tell me what a model is? Apart from just, you know, gorgeous, beautiful people like myself. Um, yeah. Precisely. So one, like what you've done um, in the debate, you've normally defined the key words. So you've been able to decide who the stakeholders are. Who are you? Are you representing the Australian government? Are you doing this on behalf of Western liberal democracies? You kind of worked out that stuff, right, when you've got a topic. But the next thing you need to do there, apart from just understanding what the debate should be about, is do something that actually goes about fixing the problem. So this one here, you've got about legalising the sale of organs. So defining about what is an organ, organ and like how you might legalise the sale, that's not enough in this debate. What you need are very clear mechanisms about exactly how that will work. So the way that I like to think about the difference between a definition, a model and your arguments is that the definition is the what. What are we talking about? What is this debate supposed to be about? The model is you know, the who, the where, the how, all those other questions. And then what happens secondly is you go through and you provide the why. So they're your arguments about why is this a good idea, why would there be benefits, that kind of thing. So it's pretty straightforward. So let's talk about the major questions you need to ask yourself. You need to be able to say who does this involve, who is going to be doing this. Secondly, you need to be able to say where this is going to be happening. So is this in Australia, is this on, you know, Western liberal democracies, are you intervening in Africa, what's happening? when, some kind of idea of an approximate time frame. Let's say legalising the sale of organs, are you going to implement this in six months? You can do it in 10 years. You know, there are lots of reasons for and against all these things, but you need to have some kind of idea of an approximate time frame. Then you also need to understand how. What is the mechanism by which you are going to do this? Are you going to have a registry where people can advertise they want to sell their organs? Is there going to be a set price by the government, like a kind of minimum and a maximum that everyone must pay so there isn't a possibility of exploitation? You need to think about every single one of those questions before you embark on the debate because you'll get calls on it. If you don't set a minimum, or like, a, like a set a price for organs, then you're absolutely going to get called on that by your opposition. A strong model is absolutely vital to setting up your case well and ensuring you're not on the back foot and answering these kinds of questions throughout the entire debate. Because if you don't set that up from first affirmative, you're never going to hear the end of it and there's a good chance you'll never come back and be able to win that debate. So in terms of actually coming up with a model, it's a bit tricky sometimes, right? Because we're not experts on who does stuff everywhere all the time. And I'm going to say I'm probably not the best person like, to know about exactly how we should legalise the sale of organs. There are a couple of ways of doing this. Firstly, you could be somebody who knows heaps about everything and you might know about a country where in the past they've legalised the sale of organs and you've probably got some knowledge about how they did it, right? Did they set up a registry? Was it just done through their own individual volition? How did it work? And you can just kind of copy that, transfer the facts you know and go bang, yep, that's what we'll do here in Australia. You could take that example and change it a little bit. So if you know that they had done this in Denmark and there were some problems with organs still being sold on the black market, how could you fix those? How could you make those problems go away? And you can adapt that model. Or what you can do is just think of something totally new. If you haven't 
you know, if, if the sale of organs is in your area of personal expertise, and that's okay. Just think about it together as a team. Think about the best kind of common sense strategies and answer those major questions, and you're most likely to have a pretty good understanding of how this should work. So in terms of where the, um, a model should come in your speech and in the debate as a whole, they're not something kind of strategically to the end. I'm sure most of you know this if you've done any debating before, but the model must come out at the first speaker of the affirmative team. That's absolutely vital. And it should come at the beginning of their speech. So as a first speaker, normally you'll get up there, you'll give a little bit of context, you kind of come up with a sassy opening, you define what you're really talking about, then you'll come straight out with the model. That kind of process, that kind of holistic overview setting up the debate probably shouldn't take you any longer than a minute. So, I mean, we're spending a lot of time talking about it now, but when it's actually happening, the debate should be pretty short, not much of an issue. It should be used in a way that cuts arguments out of the debate. So it means you're not talking about later, you're not fielding attacks about how is it going to happen and when is it going to happen and who's going to do it. You cut those arguments out of deb the debate and you cut those problems away. But what you also do is you can remove arguments you just don't want to have to deal with. So if you know that your opposition is going to say that people, um, like people who are from low socioeconomic backgrounds could be particularly vulnerable to selling their organs because they need money, one of the ways you can minimise that argument and minimise the amount of damage that it will do to your case is by making sure the government sets a price on how much you'll pay for an organ so that it doesn't matter if you know uh, that you can't be exploited and you know you might like be lured by $10,000 for an organ, somebody else only gets $1,000, those sorts of things. So what you can do is you can cut arguments out of the debate and make sure you don't have to deal with things that maybe you can't respond to. So models can actually be used in a way that's incredibly strategic and helps to make this a little bit easier for you. And we we'll, don't like the privatised water example, we're going to skip that. Cool. The next thing to think about is what we touched on a little bit earlier. And so that's a discussion about who are you? And so what I said that meant before, it's just about what kind of theoretical basis does your case have? So it's about visualising and understanding and having some kind of, um, yeah, just some kind of understanding about where your case is coming from. So if you're going to be privatising water, again, it's that kind of quite rigorous, uh, you, you know, like um, government intervention in markets, that kind of thing. And if you're on the neg, well, then you're like, great, free markets, let's talk about that. Why is that the best thing? So it means that your arguments aren't just focused on the specifics. So why is privatising water in and of itself a good thing? So just a very specific example about the benefits or the harms of doing that. It's also about a broader discussion about the way the government should operate, about whether or not we should ever have intervention in a free market and about how that can work on the whole. So that's what the case should look like. And you as a team need to discuss that from the very beginning because that theoretical understanding should be the prism through which all of your arguments flow and it should absolutely be something that allows you to have a response to any piece of rebuttal or any question that you're asked. Because if you understand the theoretical basis behind your case, you understand why you don't want intervention in a free market, you're going to be pretty well um, like adept, you're going to be pretty adept at being able to respond to most of those things that are happening. The second reason why this is really important is it gives you an ability to spot contradictions in your case. Sometimes it can be really easy to say, oh, yep, that's a benefit, that's a benefit, that's a benefit, without maybe sometimes understanding that they can be mutually exclusive or to actually understanding that you can't, you know, you may have one and then maybe another undermines that position slightly. And that's really easy to do, particularly when you've got three people in a room, you've got 30 minutes, you're throwing out arguments, and it's not often you have much time to sit down and actually think about, does this all make sense? Are these prioritised in the best way? And also, are they all consistent with each other? Particularly if you've got a first speaker who, after you've um, like had your case construction talk, want to go and write their speech. The second speaker will kind of sit down and start writing their speech. And you might not hear what they've actually written in their speech until they get up. And so when you have a really good theoretical understanding of you know, who you are in the debate, it means that those contradictions are far less likely to occur. Does you have a strong contradiction in your case? If your first speaker and your second speaker don't make sense together, you're going to lose. So it's really important to make sure that you have that discussion at the beginning of your debate, um, or the beginning of like your preparation. When I first got taught this by a guy called Tim Sonrak, who's coming in next week, what we did, this was at Austral's preparation two years ago, what we made sure we did was we had a pro forma, um, so just like a kind of sheet we used for every day or like every debate that we did for our preparation. So instead of just sitting down as a team and all just kind of jotting down notes um, like our, in our own notebooks, we had a pro forma that asked us some really important questions that we needed to deal with. And the very first one of those at the beginning was, 
who are we in this debate? So that was the first thing we discussed as a team. Then we went through and said, well, what's the problem? How are we solving it? What are the benefits? What are the harms? And through our like, brainstorming and our thinking of arguments, we answered each of those questions and it meant that our cases were rock solid. So that's a really good thing to do in a case construction. So when you're at Easter's, when you're at the first year tournament, the first thing you should do, mainly take you one or two minutes, but get that kind of basis and your case will be heaps stronger for it. Cool. Let's talk about stakeholders. This is really basic stuff, um, so I'll move through it relatively quickly. Um, basically, why we talk about stakeholders is that firstly, it's important to understand when you're doing a model and you're talking about how you're going to construct your case. Because if you screw over one of these stakeholders exponentially, so if you're banning unions, for example, it's probably tricky to say, no, 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 man, just don't worry about the workers. They'll be fine. Everything will be OK. Understand what you're doing. Understand that you may be uh, I can't think of a better word than screwing over a stakeholder and you can build in responses in your case to make sure that you help to mitigate that to say well actually here's how we get the best benefits for workers or here's how we can still ensure workers rights are protected and you can do that from first affirmative you don't have to wait till second affirmative when the first negative has called you on the fact that you're you know removing rights for workers you can build that stuff in and always be on the front foot in a debate so what we mean by stakeholders are just anyone who's affected by a debate. So let's say you were doing something like um, making uh, VC compulsory for all students. So who can give me some examples if you're talking about making VC compulsory for all students, people who are going to be affected by that? Yell them out so we've no hands up, any of that stuff. Students, students yeah. Taxpayers. Taxpayers, damn right. Parents, teachers, yeah, beautiful. So there we go, we've already got a couple of examples about people who we need to think about. So that means you can build into your case, firstly, responses about what do you do if you're a kid who wants to leave school at year 10? Are you going to be disruptive to your classmates? Are you going to undermine learning to the rest of those students? You can think about those questions and build in those responses so you're not doing it at second affirmative. But the second thing you have the ability to do then is really think in depth about how it's going to affect each of those and build that into your case. So. The last thing you can do when you've thought about stakeholders is create an argument about it. So talk about why this is actually better for teachers or why this could be worse for teachers because both an affirmative team and a negative team can do this. And so think about, so yeah, the way you create these arguments is you do it in two ways and they're listed up here. So you think about the harms, the benefits can, that can flow to that individual. But the second thing you need to do is prove why those harms are important or why that group is important because it's often really easy, and you see this as it happens quite a lot. If you're a second speaker, really struggling for arguments, you're like, oh, crap, um, oh, whatever, I'll just talk about teachers. And that's fine, and you can probably get a couple of minutes of material out of that, but if you can't prove why it's important, it's not going to hold any weight in the debate. It's not going to give any traction and help your team to win any more than it would otherwise. So make sure that the time you're talking about stakeholders isn't wasted time, and do that second step of that analysis and tell us about why those individuals are important. So the example I had up here was just that, um, oh, this one is uh, legalised the sale of organs. The one I wanted to use was about um, national paid parental leave. That's probably like a good example about affects lots of different groups. You're talking about it affects businesses, it affects governments, it affects families, both the parents and the children, So and it affects people without families. Like There are heaps of groups that have some kind of stake in whether or not we have a national paid parental leave system. So yeah, it's a good example of just how you can make arguments out of those people and you can think about people who might be kind of pissed off about it, like businesses, and kind of build in responses about why it could actually be good for them. So. Let's talk about the negative team here, because when we talk about models, models are primarily used by affirmative teams. So the affirmative team will be given a problem like, hey, we need to legalise the sale of organs because the black market has serious health and security risks, and they'll solve that problem by doing what the topic says. And negative teams have a couple of different options about the way they want to respond to that. The first thing they can do is just deny the problem and support the status quo. That can be really tricky sometimes. You need to think really carefully about whether or not this is exactly what you want to use because if you deny the problem that can sometimes put you on the back foot so let's say it's a climate change debate and you're saying no nah, sorry climate change isn't real we're going to keep doing nothing that can be a perfectly fine viewpoint in the real world if that's you know if you want to be a climate change denier but in the debating world, it's probably not a great idea just to say, no, sorry, climate change isn't real. Sorry, climate change isn't real. Because it means the debate actually won't happen. You'll be busy talking about whether or not climate change is real and not about the mechanism that you're actually discussing. 
So what you should do in that, like, if you ever want to use this thing, this um, particular uh, tactic, think really carefully about whether in denying the problem, you're actually denying whether the entire premise of the debate should exist at all. But that is one option if you're going to do, like, say, the black market debate. Deny there is actually a problem and support what's happening right now, but not one I'd really recommend. The better solution, I think, is that you agree with the problem and you propose an alternative solution. All right, so let's say you're doing a debate, use climate change again. So you're saying, hey, climate change is a problem, we all agree, man-made, carbon emissions, let's deal with it. You want to do carbon tax, we want a CPRS. Or you want to have a CPRS, CPRS where we're actually going to have uh, investment in renewable energies that the free market dictate where incentives and disincentives should actually lie. So what you've done there is you've all agreed on the problem, but you've said, hey, affirmative team, we have a better solution, and here's why our solution is better. So that means that the debate becomes a lot about uh, which policy has the best effect, and it's a lot about mechanisms. So they're often boring debates, but it's a pretty effective thing. So the third option that you have is, again, a little bit tricky. So you accept the problem, but you say that their model will do more harm than good. So what you are essentially doing there, you're implicitly doing, is you're just supporting the status quo. So saying things aren't good right now, but what you're going to do will make it worse. So what could be a good example of that? All right, so what, okay, I've got an example. So let's say again we're talking about climate change. The affirmative team has said the way we're going to deal with climate change is to have a carbon tax. In response, you can say, okay, great. We accept that climate change is a problem, but a carbon tax isn't the way you deal with it. Because what's going to happen when you do that is that firstly, it doesn't actually target consumer behavior because they get, you know, they're heavily subsidized. We think that industry won't necessarily make the kinds of changes you're talking about. By, that may, by driving up the costs of productions of goods, you're making it much harder, like you're raising the cost of living for consumers. And it means consumers are far less likely to actually engage in the kinds of problems that deal with climate change directly. They're less likely to support the kinds of policy initiatives that you want. But secondly, industry probably has far less money as a result of this to actually invest in the types of clean carbon technology or like clean energy technology that we need to actually solve the problem. It's kind of a shitty example. But basically what you've done there is you've said, hey, yeah, we get the problem, but your proposal won't solve it. It's just going to make things far worse than what's happening right now. Cool. So that makes sense to everyone about how those three can work? Cool. So yeah, they're your options as a negative team. And so how you also, and so what I was saying before, affirmative teams will almost always have a model. Negative teams will only ever have a model if they go with number two. So yep, there's a problem. Here's our solution. So you have two models engaging with each other. Oh yeah. All right. So now let's get away from this kind of stuff. So I'm sure that was quite familiar for all of you. And let's talk about hard and soft lines because not every model is the same and there are models that are better than others. And so what this means when we talk about hard and soft lines, it just means the severity of your model. How kind of crazy is it or how weak is it on a scale? Because Models exist on a spectrum, and this is what we mean by hard and soft lines that I should probably write on the whiteboard, but I don't have a marker. Basically, what you're talking about, you have a soft line over here, and you've got the hardest line possible over there. Where you want to sit as a team is pretty much somewhere in the middle. You don't want to go too far the, to either side of the spectrum, because otherwise things get a little bit tricky. Actually, that's probably a little bit unfair. How it should look is it's soft line, kind of medium, hard, then totally fucking batshit insane. You never want to go to that end of the spectrum, but a hard line can actually be really, really useful. So pardon my language, the best way to explain that. All right, so debates will give you a number of different options about the way you can deal with it. So you may have one about, we've got this one here, legalizing drugs. There's no one way to legalize drugs. There's lots of different ways that you can deal with that. And you could take a really soft line. So soft line just means an, uh, well, one that is like comparatively weaker. So if you were to legalize drugs and ran a relatively soft line, you might just do things like legalize marijuana. So probably not the drug that the debate was actually intending you to talk about. But if you're saying, yeah, there's crazy harm, everything's going wrong, blah, 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 legalizing marijuana probably won't solve that stuff. Or you could take a relatively hard line and say, yep, we're going to legalize everything. The government isn't going to supply it. You can sell whatever you want to whomever you want in whatever quantity you want kind of crazy, right? If you're trying to solve problems of people ODing and, you know, problems with the, impu like the purity of drugs, again, that's probably not going to solve it either. You've swung too far to the other side of the spectrum. By having like an open slather on like drugs and good times, it's probably also going to make it pretty tricky for the government to do something about it. So where you want to sit is somewhere in the middle, right? 
and what we'd call that, so soft line, kind of crazy line, you want to sit in the middle and that is pretty much taking a hard line and that is a substantial change to what's happening right now. And I think the best kind of model you can run in this debate is you'll legalize absolutely everything. Legalize heroin, absolutely everything, no matter how dangerous or like the potential, like whatever those potential health risks are. But what you would do instead of just letting anyone buy it in whatever quantity from whoever they want, is you'd have the government regulate it. So you would go like get a prescription for, a for, for your heroin in the same way that you'd go to a doctor. Or another way you can do it is that you just have safe injecting rooms. Um, and one of the benefits of running that instead of having to go to a doctor is actually that the, no, like the negative argument is that if you only get like 50 grams of heroin a day and you actually want 100, you're still going to go to the black market. So one of the good ways of actually running this topic is to say you can go to that safe injecting room, you can get whatever you want in whatever quantity you want. This means firstly we know that it's pure, secondly you're not funding the kind of undesirable people who sell drugs, and thirdly you have some kind of contact with health regulation, and like fourthly, the like lastly and like most obvious benefit is that there's someone there if you OD. So there's heaps of benefits you get, even though you're running a relatively hard line. And the way that you can justify that, because even though it seems kind of tricky, hey, the way that you can justify that, so it's about coming out ahead, ahead of the really like, um, tricky things that people can come up and say against you. So if you're legalizing heroin, your negative team is probably going to have something to say about that, right? But if you can come out ahead of that and you have thought about this in your case construction, the very first thing that the, your first speaker on the affirmative team should say is that we know that even though drugs are illegal, people still use them. People still buy them, they take them, they still overdose, even though they're illegal. So you accept that right now, even though they're illegal, there are still significant harms to people um, like continuing to take drugs. And then what you say then is that if we accept that, people are still going to do it even if it's illegal, we need to deal with the things that actually lead to the most number of deaths. So impure, like purity of the drugs, the fact that people are afraid to seek help because they're currently illegal, and also because people have no way of calibrating any kind of dosage. What you've done there is you've said all the problems that, you're, that the negative team are going to have don't exist because you solve them and you stop the deaths. That's like a good way of using a hard and soft line in your construction. All right. Another thing to keep in mind about hard and soft lines is that, I think I have this actually on the second slide. Yeah, cool. We're going to flip over to this one now. Okay. Hard and soft lines are important to think about, not just because they dictate how effective your model is going to be. It's actually really important in terms of being philosophically consistent. So about knowing who you are, so if you're a team that is crazy libertarian and really wants everyone to have, you know, free swipe drugs all the time, and you only legalize marijuana, there is absolutely no philosophic um, consistency between what you're proposing and what you're arguing, and that's really damaging for your case because you get what is essentially a problem-solution gap. So what you want to do, like when you have a hard line and you say, "Yep, we're going to do absolutely everything we can to minimize harm," and that's like the, you know, the thing you're going to run with and you have all your arguments are down that line, it's like quite difficult, you're going to legalise everything. It's tricky, but it means you'll be totally consistent. It's difficult, but you'll be totally philosophically consistent. But if you say you have a really soft line and you're like, oh, maybe we'll just legalise marijuana, maybe get rid of some of the harms, and you're really weak about the way that you actually deal with this stuff, you're never going to be consistent if you actually want to stop those harms. So it's really important you just take that hard line and engage with those more difficult questions. Like it says here, the best position you want to have is somewhere in the middle. So not totally crazy, not totally soft. And like the good way of judging that is firstly, just a bit of common sense. But secondly, if you like say it to your um, other teammates, they laugh at you in the face, tone it down a little bit, right? Like the laugh test is a pretty good way of just understanding about whether or not it's totally crazy. Cool. What I want you guys to do now is do the first of one of our exercises. So with the person next to you, you can move around and sit next to your friends, whatever, I don't really care. Um, is do an exercise about creating a model for legalizing the sale of organs. So you can kind of go to either side of the spectrum if you want. I can like be a nice example, but figure out how to judge which is the best way to do that. So like be that maybe you can optionally give your organs away or like the government will come and cut them out of you in the night. Like they're probably the two sides. See what you can figure out in the middle. So I'll give you guys maybe five minutes just to have a think about that. And yeah, give it a go. You lovely people next to you.
let's come back together. I want to hear what you guys um, have. Who wants to volunteer? Because I was going to disappoint you. I'm a bitch like that. Anything? You don't have to have like a total complete model. Just throw out like maybe some aspects you thought or hard or soft line, anything. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a really good thing to have in there. What organs do you guys think people should be allowed to sell? Not essential. Interesting. All right. Well, I've got a question for you. Question. Well, see, this is a really interesting question um, with this topic because it's really hard to reconcile these two things. Because you guys, if you're going to say that you have a right to sell your organs, Hopefully, somewhere in your case, you will have an argument that says you have a right to total bodily autonomy, that you can decide what you want to do with your body at any point. And then if you say, actually, you've got a total right to your body, you can, you can make that decision, a totally like conscious, rational decision to sell your organ for money, even though it might lessen your lifespan, why can't you make the decision to sell a, like an, an organ that would kill you? And there have been debaters in the past, relatively crazy debaters that have run that line. That, yeah, you can sell your brain, you can sell your heart, go for it. You got an answer? Isn't that like suicide then? Isn't that just like... Yeah. You're, you're, you're knowing you're killing yourself in some medical way. Yeah. yeah. It's really tricky because even I'm not sure exactly where I fall on this spectrum, but I think if you're like a normal rational debater, and especially in the kind of debates that you guys want to do, I think you could probably say, yes, you have a total right to your own bodily autonomy, but you probably also can't consent to death. I think there's probably some different arguments you can have there. But it is a little bit tricky. You do need to be prepared to be called on why you can't dramatically lessen your lifespan by giving away a kidney um, or like cutting up half your liver, but you can't sell your brain. So it's just so something to be aware of, particularly about like being philosophically consistent and knowing who you are. Because if you know that you are the team that stands for total bodily autonomy, you do have to question about exactly how that's going to play out in your model. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a similar kind of thing to like debates about euthanasia and all that kind of stuff. You probably want to have someone see a doctor before they get cut open and give away all their organs, right? Like it's probably like a nice kind of, um, yeah, a nice kind of check. Um, for a euthanasia debate, you maybe want to see more than one. But for this kind of thing, you're like, yep, the organs are perfectly healthy. You seem to not be under any kind of duress and you seem probably like relatively, you know, rational and able to consent. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, will you die or not? Ooh, that's... That's really... Oh, but just like... That's really tricky. I'd be really careful about doing that because what you're going to argue is the affirmative team is saying that if you want money, you can make a rational decision to weigh up money over your own health. And you can say, I prefer to have $10,000 than to live five years longer. And so if your doctor, like... I know, it's, it's crazy stuff. Welcome to the world of debating where it's like easy to argue for incest. Like that's the, that's the easier side, funnily enough. And like cannibalism seems like a good idea. Crazy. Um, but I'd be really careful because it might seem philosophically inconsistent. Um, yeah, it's tricky, really tricky. What, are, what other kind of past do people have in there? Or is that kind of covered it? Or? Oh, uh, government regulation. Interesting. Yeah, that's like, that may throw up some ideas about who's best to do it, but I'd probably say that I really wouldn't want some private company dealing in a market of organs. I think for my own, like, personal, like, mental well-being, I'd probably be happier if the government was the one doing it. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like eBay, like, <laughs> prompt delivery, fantastic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, that's actually really, that's, yeah, fantastic. Um, and I'm sure, yeah, like you were saying um, up the back, if you're a smoker or you're a heavy drinker and stuff, your organs would probably be worth less. Sucks to be you. All right, cool. So let's move on now. That's a great exercise in, like, kind of hard, soft, that kind of thing. Let's move on to problem-solution gap. This one is, per, like, my personal favourite because I love it when I'm a debater and I see teams screw up by doing this. And it's also great when you're an adjudicator and you see it as well. You're like, great, there goes the debate. Sit down, put my pen. Like, yeah. You get an hour to sit and think about like your to-do list for that evening. Because a problem solution gap will be suicide for your case. You will never come back from it. Because if you 
go really gung-ho at first affirmative about, like, let, you do a Kevin Rudd, for example. He's probably the best example of someone with a, a problem-solution gap. You come up and you say that climate change is the great, you know, moral concern of our generation, and then you don't do anything to fix it, there's going to be a problem there. Because you need to be really careful to make sure that the problem that you set up and the problem that you describe is one that is fixed by your model. Because if it's not, then you're not going to win the debate because you're trying to prove to the adjudicator that we should do this because there are going to be benefits, because it's going to be effective. You can't prove that stuff's going to happen. You're never going to win that debate. But also, if you have a relatively small problem and you have this crazy solution, you're also probably not going to win the debate because there'll be associated harms. So let's say you were saying, oh yeah, we should have a carbon tax and your solution was that like, the army should come in and like, overthrow people and like, institute it. And that's kind of crazy, right? Like, like, it's a totally like, ludicrous example, but what you've done there is you've created a model that like, firstly doesn't necessarily solve the problem, but has so many associated harms that it's going to have huge problems. So you want to always make sure those two things match up. And that might mean maybe downplaying the problem a little bit, or maybe boosting the problem a little bit, and you'll, like, that'll go back and forward in the debate, but always make sure those two things match up. So, so let's have a look at the example that's here. And this is about legalizing drugs again. We touched on it before. So if you say the problem is we have huge addiction rates that to really dangerous, harmful drugs, and that people die as a result of that, what you're going to propose as a solution is that we minimize harm. So we make sure that people have access to drugs that are safe and clean, they have access to correct types of healthcare, all those sorts of things. And the way that you solved people overdosing on heroin was legalizing marijuana, you haven't actually solved your problem and you will lose that debate. No matter what other arguments you had, you haven't solved that problem and you just can't come back from it. And it's really bad when you see teams, when the first affirmative has done this, they get called on it, then they're like, no, 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 or maybe we'll just legalize heroin as well. Doesn't fly like that. You need to have this stuff set from the very, very beginning. This is a pretty obvious example, but it can be a little bit smaller than that, a little bit more minute, a little more subtle, and it can still kind of destroy your case. But this also works in reverse, like we were saying, when you take action that is way, way too tough. And the example here, another nice climate change one, it's in vogue, where it says here that, okay, the problem is that countries aren't taking action to get a binding treaty on climate change, and the solution is to invade people, like, and to, like, yeah, who don't try and, like, try, try to get them to sign the treaty. Like, crazy. Firstly, what you've done here is if you were in the opposition, you would attack their case as not actually effectively dealing with climate change. But secondly, you have the ability there to run away with the debate, and you would win this debate because you can propose an alternative solution. It's probably only marginally more effective, right? Just having some kind of small consequence for not signing the treaty. And what you've done there is you've solved their problem and done it without the associated harms. So you would absolutely have the best position in that debate to be able to come away with the win. So you can totally exploit that when you're on the opposition and you see this. You can point out that they haven't solved the problem, propose a solution that does do it, show why there are going to be so many more associated harms, and you've done it. From first negative, you will most likely walk away with that debate. So that's a really good example of just the way the kind of problem solution gap thing plays out. And the last thing I want to talk about is prioritization of matter. And as somebody who speaks first, I think I'm so finicky about this because it's incredibly important. You can't just put your arguments together in any which way you see fit, right? Because there are really important rules about obviously the most important stuff should go at first speaker. You don't leave your best argument you've got for the last minute of your second speaker's speech. But it's not just about your team's case, it's about your own speech. Like the, the, the red flag as an adjudicator is when you hear people say, lastly but most importantly, the most important, why should I leave it till last? It's actually just, you hear that, it's just a big red flag to an argument that people haven't given enough time to. It's a big red flag that you just haven't got any kind of understanding about the way that a case should be structured. Your most important point, even if you are a second speaker and you're not dealing with the kind of crux of the case, anything that's important and could be a debate winner, you put at the very beginning of your speech. Your most important rebuttal, it doesn't matter what order, you're like the first speaker of the affirmative team did her, his or her arguments, if you hear, like if her like, last argument was the most important or a second argument was the most important, you deal with that one first. Like the internal prioritization of your own matter is incredibly important. But it's also important not just in terms of how much time you give to stuff and how much relative importance your adjudicator takes out of it. It's also important in terms of just making sense so that stuff's logical. And one thing that you need to do at the very beginning of your speech is outline what that philosophical position is. 
So if you don't think there should be interference in the free market, one of the very first things your first speaker should say is absolutely that, to outline that, that um, argument and to outline that philosophical position. Or if you're doing that organ debate, the very first thing you would say if you're going to argue that people should be able to sell their organs is tell us why you've got a right to total bodily autonomy and why you have the ability to make rational decisions that might harm you in the long term. And so you need to do those things before you do anything else, before you go in and say, hey, great, there are problems in the black, with the black market of organs right now. Let's fix up some of those. Oh, but hey, guess what? You actually have the ability to do whatever the hell you want with your body. Uh-uh. It's absolutely got to be. Outline your philosophical position, and then you can go on and say, here are the benefits, here are the harms, and deal with the practicalities. So prioritization that matter, and owning that philosophical principle is so important. The second thing that you need to be able to do here and this idea of owning your principles and knowing your weaknesses go hand in hand. And this comes back to what I said previously, which is sometimes you're going to have to argue for really, really difficult stuff. An example here is cutting off welfare to parents if children do not attend school regularly. Bad things are probably going to happen to those children in the short term. They may not have enough food to eat at their homes. There could be serious problems that exist there. And don't pretend like that's not going to happen. Don't say, well, if we cut off the welfare immediately, like there could be um, parents will stop spending that on things that the government doesn't want. And immediately, all those children will be going to school and all those problems will be fixed. Great, hey, hey, we're done. There isn't a problem. You need to acknowledge that things could actually go wrong in the short term, but then build in some responses. Say why that won't happen in a majority of cases. Say why this is the best, like, a bit like, a best mechanism for solving the problem in the long term. Outline what those long term benefits are. You can come out, it's kind of like being um, some, like a celebrity with a sex scandal, right? You come out, you put in that press release in front of it, you release the tape on your own terms so you get the revenue, that kind of thing. It's a strange example. But it means, yeah, you're coming out in front of the story, like a lot of people do who have some kind of scandal. You're like, oh, you're about to be outed or something. You come out and say, oh, hey, I was actually gay this whole time. Um, yeah, so you know your weakness in your case and you do something to actually deal with that early because as soon as you, um, you're trying to deal with that in a really reactive way, you'll have a lot of problems. Cool. What I want to do for the last couple of minutes, I promise I'm not one of those evil people that won't get you out on time to pizza, I'm not awful like that, is deal with um, an exercise to do a full case construction. So this shouldn't only take a couple of minutes. Like I said, I'm not a teacher. I don't care if you do your homework or not. But it's a good idea to try to work through this as a group. So what I want you guys to do is, again, just the people next to you, try to figure out all the different aspects of whether or not we should ban labor unions. So figure out what the keywords are, Hazard a guess, it's ban and labor unions and we. Um, deal with the model, figure out what your worldview is. So what's your kind of philosophical basis here? What's the problem now? Have you solved it? Who, who do we care about? And maybe what are some stuff your opposition might say? What I might do actually to like minimize the amount of time that it'll take. People on this side of the room, so guy in the white t-shirt, girl in the gray hoodie, from that side onwards, you guys are gonna deal with definitions, models, world's view, what we're going to deal with from this side over, you guys are going to take problem solution, stakeholders, and possible responses. So you guys kind of deal with the nitty gritty. You guys can deal with the case tactics, and we'll come back together. Cool? Beautiful. Oh, you can do it as like a giant group if you want, but if it's easy just to kind of uh, do it in uh, smaller groups, and that's cool too. I'm not fast. I'm not fast at all. Oh, sorry, gosh, so that's just an abbreviation for, um, what it stands for here is this house would, so that's like British parliamentary uh, speak, so in second semester, all topics will be phrased that this house would ban X or this house would introduce Y, whatever, um, but in three on three, it means that we should do something, so if you, you said TWS, it would be that we should ban trade uh, labor unions, so yeah, sorry.
We're all good, everyone. There was no pizza yet, I promise. Alright guys, let's come back together. Um, so we can keep fighting this stuff out and it doesn't matter who's finished all the questions, we can totally go through them together. Um, people on this side of the room, do we come up with some kind of definition? Pretty vague? No? It's all good? Um, I guess the way we we'll kind of look at this is just talking about labour unions as in like, you know, organisations of workers, that's pretty much exactly what they are, um, and just sort of banning, obviously government not allowing them to exist. Um, and I think you just, just talk about this as in Australia, um, it's a pretty kind of straightforward way of looking at it. The more tricky thing here is the model. I don't think, do you guys have any views about that one? No, no, it's all good, it's all good. It's all good. Um, couple of ways you could do this, but I think the most obvious one would just be governments not allowing, um, it sounds a little communist, like organisations of workers of X size or more, or any kind of group that attempts to represent um, workers, which is, <laughs> yeah, it seems, seems a little harsh, but probably maybe has good reason. Um, what kind of worldview do you guys think you have? You want to ban? Yeah. What's the problem with um, the problem. We'll come to this one in a second. Uh, well, you guys can answer this. This is your side. Do you have any idea? Or? Uh, they don't produce anything. They, they produce rights for workers. Thank you. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, perfect. That's exactly right. So, yeah, unions do a lot of really great things, but they also um, yeah, have a huge amount of power in things like bargaining negotiations, um, which can be both a good and a bad thing. Strikes are a huge problem. In particular, examples that get dragged out in our labour union debates all the time are things like um, healthcare workers and teachers and ambulance uh, you know, drivers and that kind of thing. It's like some very difficult questions that need to be asked, but also that people often feel obliged to join them, that there's a huge power and a culture within workplaces that you should be a part of your union that 
and there's kind of a trend towards, well, actually, maybe I should have the right not to have to opt into this and be forced to be a part of my lesbian union. And also there's some kind of stories about them beating people up, but I won't get into that. I'm being recorded. They could come after me. Yeah. What happens when the union the Yeah, so basically... Essentially, the, uh, the rights will still be extended to you. So let's say there's a bargaining agreement and you uh, secure like a $2 um, an hour pay rise. That'll still be extended to you as a worker. But what, like, the kind of argument that trade unions use is firstly that if you didn't have them, you wouldn't get that representation. But also the power of the trade union is proportionate to its size. So if it only had half the workers, then its ability to actually be part of a negotiation is really limited. Um, so that's kind of um, the way they kind of built you into it rather than actually saying, you won't get any rights. Um, we said. But also, um, unions do a lot of things in terms of like uh, dispute resolution and so on. So there are like other perks to joining and things you'll get if you weren't part of them. Um, so that's kind of the problem. Um, what about, so yeah, worldview. What kind of worldview do you guys think you have if you want to ban trade unions? Probably you sit more to the right of the spectrum, considering like if you think about the Australian political spectrum, ALP, born out of the labour movement, you'd assume you kind of sit towards that, hey, let's talk about free market workers looking out for themselves. Who are the stakeholders here? Yeah, everyone, government, business, yeah. Precisely. Do you guys, oh no, I think you do solve the problem if you ban it. Let's talk about possible responses. The last thing I promised, possible responses to the case. Because this is, again, one of the, like, my big pet things that everyone should take away from this session. Yeah, workers won't have rights. Yeah, that's precisely right. So that's going to be the biggest thing, the criticism that's going to be leveled to you from your opposition. So what you need to do at the very beginning of your case here is build in responses why they still have rights. So the way you set up your context, talk about maybe trade unions as an outdated bastion of you know, uh, you know, the world as it was 40 or 50 years ago. Talk about the fact that there are actually mechanisms in place and workers do this right now in terms of representing themselves. That the kind of, so yeah. Precisely, yeah, I think what you'd want to argue there is just that obviously trade unions are nice and fight for more rights and more representation, but the status quo is absolutely fine. The government protects the unit from unfair discrimination, will help you to arbitrate that dispute. The government makes sure you're not fired unfairly on the basis of your race, your religion, your gender, your marital status, your whatever. Like the government can do those kinds of things. So that's, that's the way you'd set up your case, right? You don't need trade unions anymore. Other people would do it, but there are also harms of having it. So what you've done there is you've built in responses to this idea that workers just won't have rights anymore and you're on the front foot. So that's a really good way of thinking about it. Cool. So in conclusion, to sum all that up, hard and soft line. Don't be too weak. Don't be too crazy. Think about your responses. Build them in. And make sure your model actually solves the problem, please. All right. That's it from me. If you have any questions, yeah, come chat to me. But if not, go forth. Have pizza. Enjoy.